Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Day. I'm the CEO of the Atlas Society. It's my pleasure to introduce today uh, my good friend George Lambert, who will be talking about the secrets of the fourth branch of government. George is the director of software development for, was it lookupflights.com? Is that right? Look, okay. Uh, he's also a state representative, and I actually met George a little under a year ago at a New Hampshire Liberty Alliance event. He actually approached me with a cell phone. He said, hey, are you the Atlas Shrug guy? So he pulled out his phone and he showed me a picture of his, of his wife's wrist with a Reardon bracelet. And it turns out there's a, an entire Facebook group called The Bracelet, and he's a huge Atlas Shrug fan. Well, fast forward a couple of months later, George and his wife Rhonda actually organized a premiere of Atlas Shrug Part Two in New Hampshire with 150 attendees, including 100 elected state officials, including also the Speaker of the House, who had expressed a willingness to fly an Atlas Shrug flag at the state capitol. So fast forward a few months later, George now hopefully will be, become the next governor of the state of New Hampshire. So with that said, I introduce George Lambert. Thank you, everyone. It's uh, always a little scary to listen to people introduce you because you know there's so much to uh, to live up to when you know you're around someone like Aaron. Um, I proposed this talk uh, to Aaron uh, because most people don't know about the power and control of administrative agencies and the fact that they operate like a like miniature governments unto themselves. I didn't understand that really well until I got into the legislature um, in, in detail. And with hope, an hour from now, you'll have a much better understanding of what they are and how you can actually directly impact change. For that, let's talk about government. Government. How many of you have heard government is too big to change and there's not much you can do about it? Anyone? Right. I used to think that too. Um, and somebody, I've heard people say, what can one man do? I used to think nothing. We can't get in the way. Now I say, look at Steve Jobs. He said, the ones who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. He encouraged in an Apple marketing campaign, think differently. After being here for the last couple days, I added this slide because if we are the men of the mind, we should embrace the Steve Jobs philosophy. Here are the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and square holes, the ones who see things differently. They are not fond of rules. They have no respect for the status quo. You can praise them, disagree with them, quote them, disbelieve them, glorify or vilify them, but about the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. What can you do? Imagine for a second that you could think and challenge assumptions. You could lead and encourage, inspire, defy conventional wisdom and demand accountability. And with that, you might get some people thinking differently too. I saw the front cover of a magazine that inspired me so much I walked out and quit my job in 1995. The cover of the magazine was the first issue of Fast Company. And it was, work is personal, computing is social, knowledge is power, break the rules. It's been my life motto for a number of years, and that's part of why I got into government. We could actually go out and change it. There are these things called administrative agencies. These people are departments and fiefdoms unto themselves. We're gonna talk about what they are and how they control our lives every single day. Administrative agencies set rules and regulations that are, and they interpret those rules independently outside of a judge or the legislature, both at a state and federal level. They also, within their agencies themselves, punish those who break the rules. This creates a problem because you have one group of people who are not elected who are both 
the set, who both set policy, who enforce that policy, and they punish all of those people who they deem are not following those policies. The rules don't have to make sense. They don't have to be consistent. They don't have to be consistent with other rules. They only have to be consistent within each administrative agency. It's a little scary. They often consider themselves above the people and the legislature. In New Hampshire, the Department of Revenue Administration, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's the New Hampshire equivalent of the IRS, decided that they were gonna implement something called an LLC tax. LLC is a pass-through agency. And they said, well, we're going to tax them like other businesses. And the legislature said, no, you're not. And the Department of Revenue Administration said, under our rules, we will. You can't do anything to us until next year. So for one year, we had an LLC tax in the state of New Hampshire because they demonstrated they had more power than the legislature and the governor. That's only the beginning of the story. Administrative rules are written by departments with no direct legislative oversight once they've been granted authority to do that. And a legislature can voice an objection, but they lack the ability to veto the rules and policies of those departments without actually going to court. Like the US Supreme Court, the New Hampshire Supreme Court has declared legislative veto efforts over rules unconstitutional. Now, I've read the Constitution of the state of New Hampshire, and nowhere does it suggest that, but the Supreme Court of the state seems to be the pre people who adjudicate the Constitution, and since they've said it would be unconstitutional for the legislature to veto them, it's the legislature's job to find another way to hold those people accountable. In the opinion of the justices, the court considered the constitutionality of a proposed law that established the standing of committees in the House to review and possibly reject rules proposed by state agencies. What I learned along the way is only the governor of a state can do that. Refer to Aaron's previous comment. <laughs> rules create strange conditions and contradictions. Agencies sometimes regulate things in a way that lead to strange results. In New Hampshire, you can own a yak, a bison, a wild boar, or an emu, but you can't own, own a capuchin monkey, unless you're an exhibitor of animals and you're planning on actually showing it off. Why? Because somebody wrote that at one point, and that's the rule. This may not seem like a big deal, but the results of these restrictions um, often make it so that people with disabilities cannot possess a capuchin monkey as a service animal unless they actually go out and get a permit or a license and go out and regularly dem demonstrate those animals. We had a sim similar problem with Quaker parrots. There were pet shops all over the state selling Quaker parrot parrots. And then one day someone realized, oh, you can't do that. So even though they'd been sold for years, advertised for years, and people had existing inventory, the state came and took everyone's parrots. However, that's no longer the case in New Hampshire because under the 2011 legislature, we actually repealed the prohibition on Quaker parrots. Doesn't sound like much, but you know I'll take every bit of repeal we can get. Needs or logic don't matter to administrative agencies. It's all about their fiefdom. We talked about the person with disabilities who might like to have uh, a service animal there are the people who have service animals of dogs or all kinds of things. But you get back to this one little clause. Are you going to do X? Do you have the permission to own your own property? After looking at it, what we've realized is that administrative agencies have absolutely too much power. They define their own rules, practices, and organizational in structure internally. They interpret those rules based on the direction of the administrative department head in that group. So you have one guy who over here sets the rules, and he tells people how to enforce them, and he gets to oversee the people who decide whether or not you're innocent or guilty, and they issue fines, and they can shut down your business. We're going to talk a little bit about the Liquor Commission in New Hampshire. And by the way, if the Liquor Commission in New Hampshire ever gets under your skin, or you get under theirs, look at it either way, and they decide that they're going to pull your liquor license while they figure it out, you will be out of business before you ever get a hearing. 
because you'll stop being able to serve alcohol, and as a bar, you're done when you are out for two weeks, never mind two years. We have lots of engagement with these things called turf wars. How many of you guys have heard the expression turf wars before? In New Hampshire, we have the Charitable Gaming Commission, and they control charity poker. You can't gamble in the state of New Hampshire for real money. I've challenged that on the floor of the state house. But you can theoretically have a friendly game of poker as long as there are no, there's no cash being, ch no, no cash changing hands. There was a group, uh, innovative group at a cigar bar who said, we want to sell cigars and alcohol. So we'll let people play for gift certificates so they can buy cigars if they win. Nobody put any money on the table. And they all showed up and played. The Liquor Commission walks in and says, we're going to enforce the gambling statute, not even under their umbrella, and arrested a whole bunch of people for not putting up any money for a poker game so that the bar could attract people to smoke cigars and drink whiskey. How many of you guys would be pleased by that? Yeah, probably not. Me either. Uh, we always end up with these challenges of jurisdiction, questions of conflicting authority, and, the, and always power struggle for resources. It's more dollars, it's more fighting, and the more you can expand your fiefdom, the larger your budget, because you say, well, we need to protect the people. I found most of the time, the people don't want to be as protected as the government wants to increase their budget. Like the three branches of government, these administrative agencies have a legislative branch, an executive branch, and a judicial branch. Now, we tell my third grader that this is the way government operates but all within one little umbrella, separately, you have all of these branches. They set policy, they enforce policy, and they adjudicate policy decisions. But they don't answer to the people. They don't answer to the judges. They don't answer to anyone without an appeal. Now, does that sound like the government anyone told you about when you were in the third grade? Not so much. Too much power under one roof you will hear about these in different states having to do with licenses, policy, they have fines. If you get in trouble with your driver's license, did you know that without ever a criminal conviction, you can lose your driver's license in some states? If they stop you too many times, but you've never been convicted, you can still lose your license. In New Hampshire, if they actually charge you with the habitual offender statute, because they don't like you or concerned about your behavior, they can take your license for a year. If you get caught driving under the Department of Safety and they pull your license and you get caught driving, anybody want to guess what happens? Take a, take a random guess what happens to you if they catch you driving. You go to jail, yes, for a minimum of one year. Now let me tell you, I was in that situation. I drove an expired driver's license. I know the date. The date was September 19th, 1992. It just so happens that I remember this because my birthday was September 4th. I got stopped by the police and they said, your driver's license is expired and they wrote me a ticket. So the next day I drove to Concord and I renewed my driver's license and they gave me this little yellow piece of paper. So I paid my fine. I mean, I paid my, I paid my renewal. Except it had 30 days on it. I didn't realize that I had paid my fee and I needed to get the little th card with a picture on it and I missed my appointment and I got stopped again with this little yellow card. I'm like, I renewed my license. And they said, no, this is expired. They wrote me a second ticket. Twice, not so good. I missed my appointment and back then you had to schedule your appointments and show up on the right day. The third time I, the third time I had a driver's license appointment, I flew into Boston. I got back to Nashua. I was driving back to work so that I could go to my driver's license appointment at 3 o'clock. I got stopped by the police that day. They asked me where I was going, and they told me I was speeding. I was going four miles an hour over the speed limit. <laughs> Pathetic, right? And I said to the guy, I have my driver's license appointment today, but my little yellow card had expired again. And when the, when the officer said, Mr. Lambert, would you step out of the car? I didn't quite understand that I was on my way to jail. I had to get bailed out to make my appointment that afternoon. 
I hadn't put anyone in danger. I hadn't actually done anything that was going to cause anyone any harm. But the judge threw the book at me and threatened me with a habitual offender statute because I had been convicted of three, yes, count them, three of the same violation, which puts you in jeopardy of habitual offender. Ask my wife. She's walking around here somewhere. She drove me around for a year because the judge said, if you get stopped one more time, I'll pull your license and make you a habitual offender for anything. He says, you get a parking ticket, I'll pull your license. He says, if you're in a car with someone else who gets a ticket, I'll pull your license. There are two things that scare me today. They are a person with a loaded firearm who is ready to use it, and someone in a black robe who has the ability to throw me in jail for contempt. Nothing else in this world scares me. They hold hearings, and they set the rules. These administrative agencies go out and decide who is and who isn't bad. They, ad they administer significant influence. They're considered the subject matter experts. They go in and tell the legislature how the law should be expanded, how the public needs to be protected. They define that policy, and they're, they have autonomous authority for the implementation of programs. They constrict free markets whenever they want to. The New Hampshire Liquor Commission will keep you from s having a microbrewery or selling any type of alcohol you want. They will do everything that they can to stifle innovation, to constrain competition, and they will ignore the, um, any jurisdictional boundaries that they want to because as long as they can say we're right, they will go out and try. The problems can be fixed. We can limit the delegation of authority. We can clarify strict judicial limits. We can stop variable enforcement. We can encourage whistleblowing. We can actually create stronger policies for official oppression, official oppression being the statute in New Hampshire, which says that if under color of law as a state employee or officer, you go out and do arbitrary enforcement that, is, that exceeds your jurisdiction, you can be thrown in jail. How many of you guys like to see a government official who does the wrong thing thrown in jail? Raise your hands. Yeah, me too. The problem is, never happens. I've called the attorney general and said, how many times has this happened? And she said, none that I can remember. I said, how long? She said, 16 years. Oh, but then the administrative agencies say, well, but there's an official oppression statute. Oh, but they don't have to enforce that. What we could do is we could create a culture and climate of accountability where these people believe that they have to answer to the people. This is all good in theory, right? How many of you think that we could actually make this happen? Can I get one? I got one hand. I got two hands. I got three hands. I got four. Oh, maybe people are getting encouraged. This reminds me of a talk I was at the other day where you start thinking you seated the audience. I didn't. But she's from New Hampshire, so she knows that we can change it. I'm going to tell you how we did it. We limited the delegation of authority for departments in the state of New Hampshire. My claim to fame in New Hampshire was one little bill called HB 222. It was one of the first ones submitted to the legislature when I got there. I said, how do we prohibit the Department of Revenue from ever pulling that LLC crap, uh, LLC tax crap again, or anything like it? And the guy at administrative service, legislative services said to me, it'll never work, but we could go out and strike the language from every department that says, any and any other matter necessary for the proper administration of this section. It's the delegation of broad-based rulemaking authority. Let's them make it up as they go along. Guess what? The governor signed it. We repealed broad-based rulemaking authority, four pages of repeal, from every major department in the state of New Hampshire with the exception of the Department of Health and Human Services who said they needed to comply with federal law. How many of you think that might be a little exciting someday? <laughs> this is our power. They, remember I said early on, they have to consistently follow their own rules. Our job is to use their rules against them. The Constitution of my state, the state of New Hampshire, and the federal Constitution suggests one thing. The power belongs to the people. 
The problem is that people so seldomly have an opportunity to exercise it. That we need to change too. The way that you change your power is to understand the process. How many of you guys have any idea how new rules are made or how many of them there are in your own state? I got one hand in the back. Okay, I got, oh, two, three, excellent. In New Hampshire, there are 13,000 pages of laws and rules which you are subject to. And we're a small and limited government state, by the way. I mean, if you look at the stats, there's nothing. Obamacare is actually larger than that. This is the process. But there are a few small linchpin times where you can be incredibly effective in this process. And in your state, if you know what this is, you can make change. Because if you can bring in 100 people for one hearing at just the right time, you will scare legislators and you'll change the rules. Now, how many of you could convince 100 people to show up in a room and scare the hell out of your legislators? It's much easier than you think. Our job is strict accountability. We need to make sure they know we're watching at all times. In New Hampshire, we have a 400-member legislature. We're the third largest legislative body in the world. There's one legislator for every 3,700 people. That means in our state, and it's probably a little different in your states, you can get on the phone, find out what your representative's name is, and say, I'm going to hold you to account. It's possible. Now, if you really want influence, I would suggest that you meet a lady named Eileen Landis over here, and another lady whose name is Carla Garrick. She's walking around somewhere, but they'll tell you how you can actually be one of those people who's one of those 3,700 who can actually call your legislator by first name, and he'll remember you, or she, or you could even be a part of it. But I'm not going to pitch that right now. I would, however, like to give the person who helped me learn a lot of this stuff uh, the chairman of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, Eileen Landy's a hand. She and her team review every single bill in the state of New Hampshire every week. They tell us when we need to show up. They create the opportunity for limited government and change. We've been able to limit jurisdictional control or jurisdictional conflict. We've been able to say there's a problem with this bill or an unintended consequence which is going to cause, cause people harm. I spent 10 years trying to repeal a bill in New Hampshire, uh, repeal a law in New Hampshire that made wiretapping illegal of police. You want to record them? You should be able to record them. That's what I thought. I started a campaign called On the Job Means On the Record. We passed a bill out of, this, out of the House to do that. It went to the Senate. And it passed, and it came back to the House. They made some changes, came back to the House. And on the day that it, we were going to pass it and send it to the governor, there was a discussion about a letter sent by the Attorney General about this thing called the Glick decision. And a judge's rule was better than our bill. And after 10 years, I went to the microphone and said, whatever you do, please don't pass this bill. I want the, judge, the judge's ruling that says, if a police officer records you, not only are you going to be found innocent, but you can find them. Now, that's a pretty cool ruling. Using their own rules against them and limiting their jurisdictional control is our job. Get these issues in the press. Legislators are scared of newspapers and public opinion. This is about the Liquor Commission's raid on the cigar store I mentioned to you a few minutes ago. Look, I'm not making this up. There's an article. Make them investigate the complaints. Set it up so that everyone's clear that they're not going to get away with it. We had a complaint about um, $100,000 worth of missing wine from the Liquor Commission. Lost out of the warehouse. Lost. Imagine after an investigation, they somehow magically found it after there was an audit. Let me tell you how they found out, because this is what's going to really scare you. State employees file a complaint against the Liquor Commission. Oh, it made the news. <laughs> Channel 9. If we use our whistleblower statutes to protect us from crony capitalism, crony attacks of government. It's quite helpful. 
My slides are in a different order, but I'm waiting to tell you about a guy whose name is Eddie Edwards. And I met Eddie Edwards. He was the chief law enforcement officer for the New Hampshire Liquor Commission. His job was to make sure that all of the people who were being regulated were doing, his, doing their job. A cop. I'm not a big fan, necessarily, of assuming that this guy is going to be working for me. I don't know why that is, but I just assume he's not. And I met him one night, and he says, do you know what? There is corruption in this state. And I'm waiting for him to tell me about how bad all the bars are. I'm waiting for him to tell me about everything else. And he says, the corruption is in the Liquor Commission. Now his job is the chief enforcement officer for the Liquor Commission. And he called him out. That's pretty cool, isn't it? You know what the response of the Liquor Commissioners was for the state of New Hampshire? They posted his job. They let everyone know he was going to be fired for calling them out. How many of you guys think that that's a uh, good and fair use of your government resources? Not a single hand in the room. They found the wine. On Wednesday of last week, the New Hampshire Liquor Commission was reduced to not three commissioners, but one. So there's one person who will be held accountable so that there's one person who the governor and the legislature can go to and say, what's going on? There's gonna be one person, one face to be held accountable. No more tag your it. We can get change. How many of you actually thought before this talk that maybe you could take and make, have a fight with government and win? Did any of you actually think that maybe you could win a fight with government before today? I got two hands over here. Oh, three, one in the back. One guy by himself can't make a difference. One group of people who holds the government to account and understands the process can lead an attack that can change a state. We can change the nation. We can take the accountability back. How many of you think that if you learn the process, you could do that? Man, I haven't done a good enough job here yet, but we got some hands. You can do it. Take these slides. Look at the documentation, follow along, and you can take back the power. I'll tell you why. Because the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights says the government belongs to you. Our founding fathers said the Second Amendment was not so that you could go hunting, it was so that you could be protected from the tyranny of government that they personally experienced. They didn't put that in there because they were confident government was going to do a good job. They put it in there because they had this idea that government was going to expand to the point where it would be the monopoly on force. Uh, a mono it would, they would control the monopoly on force that they would be able to use to push the people around. Are you tired of being pushed around yet? Yeah, you're not alone. The good news is that recently there are reports of the IRS the NSA, Benghazi. There are all of these issues where people in the streets no longer trust their government. Has anybody else had be heard better news in the last five years? We have the ability to question and change. And the good news, that for the first time that I can remember, the people have had enough. Let's help them affect change. And if the people who are responsible for affecting that change won't do it, we take them out. In New Hampshire, we're happy to show you how. Follow up with decisive action. Find the people who will show up that one day to make a difference. And you too can make your voice heard, not at the water cooler, but at the Capitol. The Liquor Commissioner uh, the Liquor Commission study says they should go to one commissioner and tighten up budgets and oversight. Remember I said to you we did that on Wednesday? This was an article from November of last year. Interestingly, right after the election. 
results are possible. When I put this slide in, I didn't know I was going to be able to tell you we did it. What we've recently learned in New Hampshire in summary is that if you limit rulemaking, you remove existing broad-based rulemaking authority, hold agencies to a higher standard and inform others that the government is not right just because they're the government, you can have an impact and you can reduce the fourth branch of government, administrative agencies and control. Your job is to remove the ring of power. We can make it happen with attention to detail and a firm determination that we're going to take the time that it takes. Changing the attitude of those in government is the first step, and then you chip away at their power until they realize that we, the people, own the government and not the government owning the people. Now, I became a fan of Ayn Rand not because I read the book. Pick any book. It's not because I read Fountainhead. Let's be honest, I haven't. I'm going to scare you. I haven't read Atlas Shrugged. I listened to an audiobook. I cheated. I admit it. I saw the movie the first time. And I'm sitting there, and I didn't like it. And I'll tell you all about it. Some, if you want, ask me in the hall why I didn't like it the first time. By the third time I saw it, which was two days later, I really liked it. I read the cliff notes, and I went, oh, I like the characters better. But the thing that struck me, and I took a picture of, at the end of the first movie was a sign that says, it's yours. Take it, as I found it. I took a picture of that in the theater. It's illegal, I'm sure. Okay, I took out my phone. I'm like, I love that line. I have it still on my phone today. It was inspiration. Because if they're not going to give us that which belongs to us, why should they have anything that does? We're not the first people ever to consider this idea. In the Midwest, in the late 1800s, government problems and government corruption was a regular occurrence. Any of you who want to get really inspired, go watch the very last episode of Little House on the Prairie. Strange, most of you probably haven't. But it's about the people who show up in town and say, by the way, we own your community and we're going to take it, but we'll hire you all. Sort of reminds me of modern government. They say, we'll pay you a fair wage, but we're going to take your property because it's on our land. And the government shows up. And they say, we're going to enforce this rule. You're going to have to turn over all your property at noon on Sunday. At 11.45 on Sunday afternoon, they began blowing up the town. And the government, the guy who owned the new property said, they're destroying my property. And the guy from the military said, not for 15 more minutes, they're not. Right now, it's theirs to do with as they see fit. And they left that town leveled. And all of the communities around them said, you know what? We'll do the same thing if you come to our town. It's an hour and 45 minutes. It's not as good as Atlas Shrugged. But it will remind you that that which you control is yours. And you should go out and understand how you're going to tell people that you're going to protect your property or they're not going to have it. This is your government. Protect it. Protect it for you. Protect it for your friends and your children and your children's children by taking it back. It belongs to you, and it has to be done before it's too late. Because at the rate we're going, it will never belong to us again. If there's any time left, I'll happily take questions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this is a different kind of question. Go ahead. Uh, can we get a copy of your slides? Absolutely. Uh, I, if you, I will actually post them uh, and make them available. I will post them on my Facebook this afternoon as a link so that you and the public can see them. If anyone wants to follow me on Facebook, I am at uh, www.facebook.com slash podjacker, P-O-D-J-A-C-K-E-R. And if you don't wish to follow me on Facebook or engage in the Facebook NSA conspiracy, 
uh, please send me an email, marchon at gmail.com, and I will send you a link to the slides as well. Go ahead. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'll take a little bit of a different attitude about some of the things you're saying. Why is it so great to have one liquor commissioner versus three? Shouldn't the goal be to root it out altogether and just let a free market happen, pull the government out of it? I appreciate the, the progress, but isn't it better to just rip it out, root, you know, root and branch? I would love to do that. The culture of New Hampshire doesn't currently give me the ability and is not part of our system. However, why not? Uh, I mean, why not well, reach a little higher, I, I guess is what I'm saying. If, um, you'd, if you'd let me finish. The gentleman that I interviewed last week on the off chance that I became the governor of the state of New Hampshire said that the first thing we would do if we could get him appointed to be the chairman of the Liquor Commission is to remove the state's exclusive distribution on um, grain alcohol and to make it so that it was more free market and anyone who wanted to sell wine or other things could actually start selling them in stores to get rid of the stranglehold that the state of New Hampshire has put on the distribution of alcohol. At the moment, it has become, it's so large that only they can control it. With three liquor commissioners, we would never actually have that pass because they would have to give up more control. If we get one, and that one actually does the right thing, we could change distribution. Um, the state of New Hampshire has liquor stores on all of the highways at all of our borders. It's a revenue generator for the state and a control mechanism that is not gonna go away unless we bring in a culture of change and accountability, which I believe we can do. But right now, um, that won't happen in the next year and a half, certainly. Thank you for asking the question, though. Feel free to a do a follow-up. I have a follow-up, a right. little bit different. I lived in Manhattan for quite some time, and there are a lot of big city agencies and that are involved in building and things like the Port Authority. Does that fall under the administrative agency yes. unregulated? Those Aren't are the there people. just giant amounts of money going through these organization, enormous corruption and graft, and what can an individual do with that? I throw that out to chew on a bit. Oh, uh, that's exactly what we spend a lot of time talking about. Um, and the first thing that you need to do is find the place at which they have, they acquire rulemaking authority. In New Hampshire, that's uh, a system called JALCAR, the uh, Joint Committee on Legislative and Administrative Rules. Um, and you have something similar to that in every jurisdiction that goes out and adopts these rules. If you want to change that, you go and you find out when they're going to meet and when there are new rules, and that's when you bring those 100 people I was talking about to protest. When a group of people did that in Rochester, New Hampshire, about the new zoning ordinance, they filled the room. And what would have been a rubber stamp approval of the new zoning ordinance was something that none of the people on the board would vote for after 100 people showed up. It went from being a rubber stamp, we're going to do this, to it's too hot, we're not going to touch it. When you can actually create fear of accountability in those officials, you can actually make change and have a voice and a say. It's all about understanding the calendar and the timing. Does that help? Hi, my name is Marcel. Uh, thank you for this uh, inspiring lecture. I really liked it. Um, I'm from Brazil. I was one year reporter, and right after that, I decided to enter politics, and I was elected city councilor. I was 18 then, so Congratulations. I was four years uh, city councilor. Thank you. And well, um, but the the big issue is I, I I tried to be state representative also later. I ran. I got a good amount of, vo of votes, about 14,000, which was uh, very. Uh, very good, actually, for the for the resources I had and so on. Uh, however, uh, what I see in your speech and that I see that is lacking in many of us who want to be in politics and uh, is is like this organization skills about how to be inside politics, but at the si same time with a foot not in party politics, but outside in society organizing. And you said you we could. Uh, talk. I think in person it was with uh, Elaine. Is that right? Eileen uh, Landis. Eileen. Uh, I about didn't do it. This. I honestly, I didn't do this by myself, and if it were just me, there was no way it would be possible. 
but I, I think for us here, uh, I, I, I know her time is scarce too, and our time we're not going to be able to approach one by one, every, you and her like afterwards. I think you could explain a little bit more about how you did organize this together. Okay. Uh, because I think this is really inspiring, only not only here in the United States, but also for those who are uh, engaging in politics uh, elsewhere in the world. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. What I would encourage you to do if you want to understand what happens at the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance is to go to their website at nhliberty.com. Dot org, sorry. You need to have the dot com thing. Um, at NH Liberty, they take every single bill that's being considered in the New Hampshire legislature and they have someone read it and review it for its uh, threat to the people on liberty and whether or not it's pro or anti-liberty. So they start with every single bill. Then they track them. They have people who are not in the legislature, and a large number of them, there are over a thousand bills a year that get put through the legislature. So it's a team effort. It's like a whole bunch of ants going out and searching for liberty. And they rate them. And they rate them in terms of threat and expansion of freedom. And the, f the, the farther down the list on uh, threat to liberty they are, or the, the higher up they are for expansion of liberty, the more attention that the bills get. And that way, you can use a small number of resources for maximum amount of impact. They have guidebooks on there on how to get elected, on how to research bills, what makes bills pro and anti-liberty. It's all out there. It's all free, and it's all available. I would encourage anybody who wants to to actually contact the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance and say, how do we set up a liberty alliance in our state if you can't move to New Hampshire? Ask about the software. Ask about the activism and the documents and how it works because it can be replicated in every state. We can't replicate it, We're, but we are actually being effective in our state, and this could be replicated in every state legislature in the United States, and it could be replicated throughout the world from anyone who has a democracy. The trick to winning is gaining credibility amongst the people who have a voice. As a city councilor, you know what I know as being a member of the Board of Selectmen in Litchfield. Any one member can sit there and ask questions in public, and there's nothing they can do to suppress your questions, even when they call you out of order or say no. And you keep asking. You keep saying, what are we going to do to be transparent and open and solve a problem? I, I'm not sure if you've used that ability as a legislator, as a member of your city council yet. Yes. But it's the biggest power we have. You get one voice in the public who is an elected official asking questions for which no one else wants to answer and they're really uncomfortable, all of a sudden, the next election, you go, hey, these guys wouldn't answer anything. And then you get someone else. I would love to say we could do this overnight. If there hadn't been years and years worth of work before I got elected in New Hampshire, I could not have accomplished what we did. But under our Speaker of the House, we established something called the Redress of Grievances Committee, where we held our state departments accountable in New Hampshire and we reduced the gross bottom line budgeting in a, on an 11, million, 11 billion dollar budget to 10. We reduced it by a billion dollars, almost 12%. And how did we do that? We just hammered on, we're going to be accountable, we're going to behave well, and we're gonna be transparent. It takes time, but when you get enough support for that, you can move mountains. It's never been done before. So I think there's hope. Go ahead. No, I just want to thank you. Uh, systems are different throughout the world, but the, I think that the point we have in common, like you're saying some institutional like tricks that you could use, I think they're all very important and you have to use it up to where you can. But the most important here is really to have civil society with mm -hmm. you because that is the way of you know having a chance inside politics but with the support from outside. That's it. Thank you. Thank I'm you. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you three more things that I find helpful. Maybe you'll find them helpful too. How many of you think it's really odd I'm inside wearing sunglasses? Right, it's crazy, right? There's no need, except for one thing. Any of you can say, oh, you see that guy over there with sunglasses? Not the guy in the jacket, not the guy in the tie, everyone's got that. If you're going to have a voice, be visible, number one. Two. Let them know you will never, ever, ever back down from your principle. And number three, play 
by their rules and use them against them. You want to see something inspiring? Go out and start you go out and start searching on YouTube for the people in Turkey and their protests. The government said, "You can't speak. You can't hold a sign." And I'm not talking about years ago. I'm talking about a couple of weeks ago. How many of you guys know that? How many of you watched someone's backpack get searched while that man stood there? And he stood there for hours. The police asked him questions and he didn't answer them. He didn't even look back at them. They searched his backpack and people put it on YouTube. And they harassed him and it got tweeted. And within a few hours, a couple people were standing with him. And a couple people were standing with him after that. There were so many, the police came and started arresting them. And they YouTubed and they tweeted that too. And within two days, 85 cities in Turkey had people doing silent protests but not breaking the law. They weren't shooting their mouth off. They weren't holding a sign. They just made their voice heard even though they never moved their lips. It's your ability to cause them to believe you're unstoppable that will give you the power to fight government. And with that, thank you very much, and I hope you're inspired.